Okay, yeah, so <clears throat> welcome back. Um, so, so last time uh, we, we discussed uh, this theorem of, of Tsao, uh, where's the statement? Maybe we don't need it, but uh, yeah, so, so we have a, a yeah, the theorem of Tsao is we have a, a Kähler manifold uh, with, with vanishing a first churn class. <clears throat> then you can take any, any Kähler metric and then this, this Kähler-Ricci flow exists uh, for all positive time and moreover converges to Ricci flat metric. So this is sort of the optimal kind of theorem one tries to prove. Uh, yes, can theorem. you say what is the name of, of the author of the theorem? Is Sao? Is that A-O or? I am not an authority, but I, I, <laughs> I think it's like Sao. Sort Which of like T-Z-A-O is kind of how it comes oh, out of my mouth, like Sao. But I probably someone else should tell us. I, I I don't think I'm really an authority on how to say it. Um, I don't know. I think I think it's like Tsao. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, but so uh, today I wanted to discuss so um, uh, a theorem which uh, is sort of I guess you could regard as an extension of that to to the non kähler case. Well, to, to the pluricloze flow case, uh, which at least covers some interesting uh, cases. So here's the theorem. Um, so we're given uh, like a, a standard torus. So, so T2NJ uh, A Kähler torus, so so just a, a quotient of of C n, and then if we're given uh, omega naught, uh, a pluricloze metric, pluricloze metric on on this, so so any any metric at all, um, the solution. to pluricloze flow uh, with this given initial data so it exists on an infinite uh, time interval and converges uh, exponentially to a Kähler, in fact, a flat metric. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so obviously we're we're in a we're in a very restricted uh, setting, right? I'm I'm only considering the case of a of a torus, but but with that with that strong restriction, we're getting the strongest possible result, right? So we have an arbitrary initial data and we get smooth, uh, smooth global existence. And then moreover, uh, convergence to the, to the simplest, simplest kind of limit. Okay. And so, yeah, so I want to, I want to discuss uh, the proof of this today. Is the initial data not killer? Uh, yeah, right. That's of course. Yeah. There's nothing to do new, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so most definitely uh, strictly pluricloze. Yeah. So, so yeah. So not Kähler. Um, yeah. If it's Kähler, this is already a, a in very easy case of of Tsao's theorem. Um, so yeah. So let let's let's discuss uh, the proof. So. So the pretty much the the first thing we did uh, in the case of of Tsao's theorem was this scalar reduction. But here, so as we discussed uh, before, pluricloze metrics are they're just not described by functions. They're the, those sort of local generality is of a of a one zero form. So, but what we can get instead is a one zero form reduction. 
And what do I mean by this? So, so we have to recall the equation. So, so we have um, del omega del t. This is supposed to be uh, this bismuth Ricci curvature projected onto the one one piece. But how can I express this? So, so, so this is expressed as follows. So this is del del star with respect to omega of omega, or sorry, I'll minus this, minus del bar, del bar star omega, omega, and then minus um, the, the churn Ricci curvature, okay? So this is just some, I mean, this is just some curvature identity. Um, uh, that holds in general relating the relating the, the bismuth Ricci curvature with this with this churn Ricci curvature. Okay. But then, well, and, and not, I'm just gonna go ahead and simplify. Like we we also want to sort of express uh express this this churn Ricci term um, using um, like the exterior derivative and, and how that looks in this case of a, of a flat background. So I can just record this term again. And then I'm gonna get a plus uh, I, sorry, just a moment, so plus, uh, I uh, dd bar log of my given omega to the n over, let's say I, I picked one of, one of these background flat metrics. So omega flat is some choice of, uh, of a flat Kähler metric. Okay, and then this is just uh, this is just like this transgression formula again for the first churn class. Okay, and of course the normally it would be like the, the difference of churn Ricci curvatures would give me this term, but of course the the churn Ricci curvature of the flat metric is zero. <clears throat> Okay, so now I have this this concrete uh, expression for the flow, and um, I can now sort of reduce it to to a flow of one zero forms as follows. So I'm basically going to uh, assume uh, I can express omega. This is not really an assumption, but um, I, I, it is possible to set things up this way. So I, I assume I can express it in terms of a background metric plus um, uh, D bar alpha plus del alpha bar, okay? So, so this is like omega time T and then alpha maybe depends on T, okay? And again, this is sort of the, this isn't exactly how I said it last time, but but this is basically how we set up the Kähler Ricci flow, like against a certain background. We sort of picked some background metric and uh, and set it up as this parabolic Mange and pair equation, sort of against some some choice of background. Okay, and then what, you can sort of then guess what the equation is that you want. So sorry, here alpha. Um, here alpha sub t is will be a one zero form. Okay. And you can see what, what the equation is uh, that you want. So, so del alpha del t ought to be a negative um, 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 d bar star sub omega omega. Um, I have to get the sign right. So, <clears throat> um, so minus I over two uh, del log omega to the n over omega flat to the n. 
Okay. And so, well, it's it's easy to see. Um, so, I have a question. If you, if yeah. I, so, so even in the killer case, you have always a choice of constant. Here, you will have a choice of a function, I guess. In this reduction. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm going to mention that in, ju in just a moment. Yeah, this is, I think, an important issue. Yeah. Um, but let me just first of all make the simple remark. So assuming uh, alpha t a solution of star, uh, it's it's I don't know. May, maybe I can sort of skip this part. I, I hope it's sort of clear. Uh, then omega t a, as defined above this flat metric plus del bar alpha t plus del alpha bar t uh, solves this very closed flow. Maybe I, can I get it all on the screen? Yeah. So so it's just it's just some really easy manipulations at this point. Assume assuming you could solve this, um, you you just can't, you just pl plug this equation and, and take some derivatives formally and and manipulate and you just see that you're recovering this this right hand side. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so so uh, this well, yeah. Let, let's let's make a remark based on uh, what what Vesti just said. So so let's note. Um, well, and you can already see it. So so in, in this expression, so just thinking that locally. So so forget anything about the PDE. So so in, in this expression. Um, uh, there's a like what you could sort of think of as a gauge ambiguity. I mean, it's not literally a, a gauge theory thing that, at least as far as I'm aware, but it's sort of plays the same role analytically. Where if I if I say alpha tilde is um, alpha. Um, it should be a pure imaginary, right? Yeah, plus uh, I del F, where where F is a is a smooth function, a, a real smooth function. Then um, then these two are the same. Okay. Oh, did I, let me just uh, look for one second. I guess I got it wrong. Maybe I want it to be pure real, I think. Yeah, I think that's the way I want it. Yeah, so, so, so yeah. So you have this arbitrary choice of function um, in a sense that, that you could add uh, and still describe the same metric. And, and this does, um, well, it presents some difficulties and, and maybe later uh, if in some of these results about Kalerici flow, it turns out that there is a way. Um, so, or let, let me just pose it as a question. So a question, it's not a very precise one, but what is a meaningful way to sort of resolve this gauge ambiguity? Uh, along, along very close flow. Um, I, if, if we get far enough, I, I'll, <clears throat> um, mentions sort of one somewhat ad hoc way that one can sort of get a strictly parabolic system out, um, uh, which, which, which sort of recovers this, this alpha flow and is, and is useful in, in several settings, um, but is sort of not completely canonical. It's, it's kind of an onsatz. Okay. And, 
and I guess may, maybe the point is, uh, maybe I should uh, sort of inter, interleave here. The, the flow on alpha is a degenerate parabolic. And this is exactly sort of the same circle of ideas, like going like the forever ago when we discussed like short time existence of Ricci flow, generalized Ricci flow, right? You have this like diffeomorphism group acting. And because of this, the equation has some degeneracy. And so it's a very similar thing because you have this kind of infinite dimensional sort of degeneracy and how you describe the metrics, this corresponds to a degeneracy in the equation. And so, um, it's interesting to ask, like, how, how can we sort of mo maybe modify this in some way to, to resolve this? Um, if it were an elliptic problem, it would be clear what you want to do. You just want to basically freeze the real part of del star alpha. Essentially, you want to prescribe this to be zero or something. And so that that would resolve it. But in the parabolic setting, it's, it, you know, it's a nonlinear condition in terms of the metric you're describing. So you can't really preserve that along the flow. So it's not exactly clear. In, in any case, th this is very, I think, maybe technical. It's more technical than what we need for today. I just want to point this out. Um, okay, so, and then maybe just, a, just one more remark. Um, the equation for alpha sort of strictly generalizes at least in this special case, but it can be done in general, the reduction of Kähler Ricci flow to a parabolic Mange Ampere equation. Okay. So, in particular, um, just to make that a little bit more precise, so in the discussion of of Tsao's theorem, we had this reduction to del u del t is uh, like log uh, omega plus i dd bar u to the n over uh, omega to the n over some some background to the n. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I I just realized the the way I, the way I wrote this um, uh, maybe didn't make completely clear that this metric here is always like the alpha metric, okay? Anytime we write omega, it's always the one associated to, to alpha. Um, the, way, the way we sort of referred to, to this one as omega u. Um, but in any case, <clears throat> we, we basically reduced the whole, the whole structure to, to this equation. And then of course, like alpha, uh, is um, like I del U uh, is a solution, or maybe over two, is, is a solution to, to this alpha flow, okay? <clears throat> so this is maybe the, the right way to, or in any case, it's one way to think about um, this, this alpha flow, okay? So, Again, you, you don't have a scalar reduction. You can only get this sort of one zero form reduction. And this is kind of, th this term in any case is like a sort of gradient Mange Ampere term. We took like del of this Mange Ampere operator. But then of course we, we further have this like kind of Lie form type term. This is essentially the, the Lie form along the, along the flowing uh, data, some piece of it anyways. Okay. So this is all, of course, true on just uh, Calabiao manifold, not... Yeah, yeah, in fact, yeah, yeah, with adding, yeah, let's add then a third remark, yeah. Um, so, I, I didn't discuss even how to do it for, for Kähler Ricci flow in general, but it's it's easy to, to see how it works. So So this can be, done by, by which I mean the alpha reduction for a pluriclosed flow uh, inside, as long as you're staying inside the positive cone. 
So this is the usual thing. This is like, as I guess we discussed this a few weeks ago. So maybe I add a word here. So um, positive or positive cone in uh, Eppley cohomology. So, so we discussed, right, this, this sort of theorem where as long as the, the associated Kähler class stays in the positive cone, you can expect the Kähler Ricci flow to exist. And there's a sort of similar idea for this one. As long as your Epley class stays in some positive cone, maybe you can expect the flow to exist. And in a sense, the point behind that is that as long as you do stay in this positive cone, you, you can construct this like alpha reduction of the flow, this one form reduction. Okay, um, so this this will be useful to us in in a in a very concrete way uh, that I'm that I'm going to show. Um, but so the 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 proof. So so that was sort of the first step where we discussed in Sal's theorem is getting this this reduction to parabolic complex modulus pair, and then step two, um, we have to get uniform. Estimates for uh, for the metric, and what we mean by this is like lambda inverse omega flat is less than or equal to the, the time dependent metric, which is then less or equal to lambda omega flat. Okay. Okay, and yeah, so Jeff, one yeah. one question. So, what happens if you impose by hand that your alpha is a i times partial u for a function, even in the non in the non Kähler case? Well, it, it won't be preserved. So as soon I as mean, you run it, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Um, that that won't be preserved by by the flow. Um, I, I guess you could just sort of see that basically because yeah, 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 yeah. because this term just is not exact. Um, so like DDT del alpha will not uh, remain zero in general. Well, but I guess, yeah, even if it does, it's maybe still not clear, okay. um, but yeah. Um, okay, so so yeah, and of course the, the main tool uh, is the maximum principle. And so as before, uh, I'm gonna say this heat operator is H so, so this is the the time dependent uh, churn Laplacian. So, so okay. all right. And so, um, well, I mean, some some computations have to be done, and uh, the. So 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 first uh, we actually can prove like, like the the lower bound. So if we apply uh, the heat operator again, one one wants to 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 get a sort of a lower bound for the metric. It makes sense to take the trace with respect to this moving metric of the background metric. This is essentially the sum of the inverses of the eigenvalues of of omega measured with respect to this flat metric. But then for, for various reasons, uh, it maybe makes sense to also take a log. Actually, we, we don't really need to do that in this case, but let's just do it anyways. Um, so, so this is very similar to the, to the quantity we estimated in when I discussed Sal's theorem, but actually the, the, these two were, were swapped. Um, but it's just a question of directly getting the upper bound or lower bound. Um, and, and the computation that has to be done uh, shows that that this will be 
uh, less than or equal to, let, let me not be precise about it. I mean, this is written out in the papers, but this is less than or equal to a quantity depending on the, the churn curvature of omega flat um, acting on omega inverse uh, twice. Okay. So it's sort of, it's in any case, it's acting in the natural way where uh, you're basically seeing the bisectional curvatures of, of omega flat. I mean, Okay, maybe it, maybe it's a little silly the way I wrote it. I, I, this this computation would hold in general, but then the point is, of course, that that the churn curvature of of omega flat is zero. Okay, so this is uh, zero, and so this is uh, this is um, well, I would say this is probably the the main place where we're using this very strong hypothesis, right? So you oh, maybe you remember, like last time we, we got this sort of bound on the volume form without, uh, in the Kähler case, I mean, sort of without uh, working all that hard. And then we had to do this trick with the potential to get the upper bound um, on the metric. Here is, well, in any case, I don't know how to sort of do that kind of thing yet. And so that's why we need this very strong hypothesis on the background curvature to just drop this otherwise nonlinear term out. So this is like the, the weakness of, of the result is, is showing here, right? So I, I definitely need this, oops, this, this curvature term to, to have the right sign, or in this case, just vanish to get this to completely uh, go away. Okay. So if you have negative bisectional curvature, it's still in good shape, right? Yes, exactly. And then maybe, yeah, um, yeah, maybe I'll add, maybe I'll add a remark here uh, to that effect. Um, if omega is negative in a certain sense, then you'll be able to prove long time existence. And this is something I did jointly with. Um, uh, someone who was, I guess he was coming for a while, but maybe doesn't come anymore, Manchon Lee. Uh, this was like last year, or I forget what year it was. Um, you, you can get long time existence, and then you can also get convergence in some settings if you make even some further assumptions on, on the background curvature. Uh, long time existence, and then uh, maybe convergence of the normalized flow. Although that needs the convergence of normalized flow when uh, when omega is um, is is actually like sort of strictly bounded away from zero in, in a certain sense. This is like basically in terms of the bisectional curvatures. Of course, if it if it is negative but has uh, some zero directions, then you can't expect convergence of the normalized flow anymore. Um, but yeah, let, let me not uh, maybe go into that too much, but, but yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay, yeah, so, so, so immediately, immediately by the maximum principle, We get that. Is it, um, is it is it key that you use this churn Laplacian? But what do you mean by the churn Laplacian? You take d and then the the adjoint for the for the churn connection. Uh, I think yeah, you, you can think of it that way. In this case, it's it's literally um, in literally in in complex coordinates. This is just like um, omega j bar i del over del j bar of some function f. I mean, I'm only applying it to, to smooth functions, but yeah, but it's like, it's the, the, the churn, it's the Laplacian associated to the churn connection in context, yeah. So if you, if you take the Hodge Laplacian, then this, you don't get these nice results. You get a more messy well, stuff from it. Um, it doesn't pay to do the, well, yeah, it doesn't really pay to do the calculations that way because somehow, yeah, I, I'm completely skipping like the actual, computations um, but uh, but of course in the end right I, I'm applying this heat operator to to a, to a scalar right to this function and, and the churn Laplacian maybe I can squeeze it in 
Um, there, there's basically an identity where, again, the the signs and whatever I'm probably going to get wrong, but but like the the Ramanian Laplacian will be the the Chern Laplacian plus uh, like an action of the, of the leaf form. So, so basically they differ. So at least as far as applying the maximum principle, of course, the, this gradient term is irrelevant. So in a sense, you, you can use either. It's not really all that important, I suppose, but um, at least it's much easier to, to carry out these calculations just directly using the churn connection. Um, and, and, you know, and this, this extra gradient term will be there if you, if you use, you know, the, the Ramanian Laplacian, if you use, excuse me, the, the Ramanian Laplacian instead of the Chern Laplacian, then there will be some extra like gradient term on the right hand side, which again, it doesn't affect applying the maximum principle. It's the same, you get the same result. Um, it's just a little bit cleaner, I guess. Yeah, I think in general, it's an interesting question. Like what is the right heat operator? Maybe for like tensor quantities, it becomes a more, a much more delicate issue. But for these scalar quantities, it's almost just a, you know, it never really will affect the maximum principle that much, but it maybe becomes a question of just like, what is the most convenient way to do the calculations basically? Um, and yeah, like for instance, ju just to emphasize, like it is the, it is like the churn curvature showing up here. But okay, yeah, so, so the maximum principle immediately gives uh, the upper bound. So, so the supremum at any forward time t of trace omega t omega flat will be less than or equal to its initial value, which I'll just denote by a constant. Okay. So, okay, so, so that's the... That's the, the lower bound. So we already got, got this one. Um, and then so, so now, now we want to get the upper bound. And again, you, the, we want to sort of use this algebraic trick of saying, well, instead of estimating maybe the trace directly, I'll estimate the determinant. And then algebraically, that will give me an upper bound. So. So, so how to get this upper bound. So what I'm going to do is again, measure the, the volume forms. So, so, the, so the volume form ratio. And what you get in this case, and again, there, there is a, a background term, a background curvature term in general, which, which I, okay, I guess maybe we can write it. So, so it's, um, is minus the trace with respect to omega t of the churn Ricci curvature of omega flat, and then plus the magnitude of uh, t squared with respect to g t, where where this um, t is basically del omega is the torsion. Of the of the churn connection, and then of course, yeah. So so I took the pain to write this term, but of course this 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 term is just zero, right? This is just. And again, I'm sort of using some of the background structure here, although this one is less severe. So. Um, so yeah, so I'm getting ma magnitude t squared here, which is a uh, bigger equal to zero. But so this, of course, by itself is is not that helpful. I already kind of knew that I had this lower bound for the metric, and instead, what I really want to be able to do is to, you know, I I sort of what I need is is an upper bound. Okay. And here actually is where uh, the, the one form reduction, so maybe again, I should sort of emphasize that so far for these calculations, these are pure tensor calculations, this reduction has not mattered at all. 
uh, for these calculations. But then finally, finally, it it rears its head. So, so, so to bound this term, I'm going to use this this one form reduction. Okay. All right. So, and again, what, what I'm going to do is measure the, the one sort of natural quantity that is independent of this gauge issue. Okay. So in particular, I'll say beta T is del alpha T M two zero. Okay. And it's very easy to see uh, what the evolution of beta is. So, so um, del beta del t is exactly um, del del bar star sub omega omega, which, when you look carefully, this is minus the bismuth Ricci curvature of two zero. So this is exactly the the two zero part. Of bismuth Ricci, um, and I think I think I mentioned at some point that this was kind of a um, a natural thing to include, sort of as part of the definition of of Clary close flow, even though it's not strictly speaking necessary to to give to give the metric. And you, you see, we're sort of uh, rederiving it in a sense as a consequence of this of this one form of this natural one form reduction. Okay. But then here's the here's the sort of miracle. Uh, and again, if you just look back, it, uh, I just want to sort of emphasize this point. This is like this quantity is independent of the gauge issue I mentioned. Okay, so we might expect it to have <clears throat> a nice clean heat equation. I guess there's a minus here. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, it it does. And so so uh, so the claim is that this heat operator applied to the magnitude of beta squared, again, measured with respect to the time evolving metric, equals uh, minus the churn uh, covariant derivative of beta squared minus uh, del bar. Um, beta squared. So, so here I may, maybe I emphasize uh, this is like um, this is like the the one zero uh, part. And there's actually one other term, but let me just forget it. It's not necessary for us. There, there's one other negative term which involves a sort of a norm of beta hooked into the torsion itself squared. But let me just drop that one. Okay, and then again, because of the way things are set up and some special facts about the background, this del bar beta, if, if you look back at the reduction, um, well, here, maybe I just write it out. So, so note, um, uh, if we take del omega t, this is del of omega flat plus del alpha bar plus del bar alpha. Uh, and then because it's because it's Kähler, because because this flat metric is Kähler, of course, del of that is zero, del squares to zero. So this middle term will be zero and it's just minus del bar beta. Okay. So this del bar beta is in fact measuring the entire torsion tensor, if you like. And so, so just to, to summarize uh, this discussion, um, the heat operator um, applied to norm beta square will be less than or equal to negative norm torsion squared. Okay. So this is an immensely useful thing, right? So it's a it's a positive function, right? It's it's norm squared of this tensor, and and it's 
it's a subsolution of the heat equation. And moreover, on the right-hand side, we're getting this inhomogeneous term, which is exactly of the kind of helpful kind that we're going to need. Okay, and so again, yeah, th this is just some some lengthy computation, that, but it it does contain uh, some miracles and, and is also uh, uh, maybe again I just sort of emphasize this kind of has uh, has some background terms in general. Jeff, sorry, I, I have a question. So this beta seems to be a, a completely geometric object. It doesn't depend on any gauge or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like it also defines uh, some sort of a symplectic form taming the, um, the complex structure if you, if you take omega plus um, um. D bar, uh, I guess, D, D beta or you know, something like that. Well, actually, you have to take omega plus beta plus beta bar. So this will be closed. That's what you wrote just. Well, it's true. It's true here. Uh, I, I think may, maybe I suppressed a little bit too much, but but it's what you say is true, but it, it depends on the fact that I sort of set things up against a Kähler metric. Yeah, yeah. In general, uh, that won't be true, but but it is true here. Yeah, that that's kind of the natural definition of this beta. Well, or? so like I was, yeah. So so in general, um, like I said, you you can uh, take f forget the equation in the middle. Just just take beta evolving by minus rho bismuth to zero. This is like a just a useful object to to keep track of, um, and, and it sort of has still some fairly useful evolution of this kind, which, um, well, in any case, which is helpful in the analysis. Um, but I guess in general, uh, um, w well, yeah, I, I mean, that, that, is, that is the general definition. So I guess eventually, I, I, um, I was gonna, I'll say more about this, I guess, at the end, but, um, it's possible to sort of generalize this proof that I'm showing to cover a, a much bigger class of cases. And this is like joint work with Mario and Josh. And basically it involves sort of a more geometric interpretation of this beta. So probably it's not a huge surprise that this beta has something generalized to it, right? This is like the B field. <laughs> And uh, and sort of by properly sort of interpreting this in a, in a sort of generalized way, uh, we can take care at least of a, of a much bigger class of background manifolds. Um, like the, this original proof, it was kind of a little bit of a, of a hatchet, right? By having like a flat Kähler metric, I had sort of no background geometry of any kind to worry about. Um, but. Uh, but in a lot of these equations, there's some sort of awkward background terms like lurking, which make it harder to, to use these equations. Does it make sense to consider uh, um, evolution of um, symplectic forms uh, given by the full Robbie? Yeah, yeah. So, well, so yeah. Just exactly. that this, this, this has a solution always. Exactly. I, I mean, I guess maybe I won't go, I don't know how far up it was, but uh yeah let, let me not let me not bother but but yeah so i think i discussed uh, at some point um like del omega del t is like rho bismuth one one and then del beta del t is minus rho bismuth two zero so indeed it's like you are keeping track of say f is omega plus beta plus beta bar like a, a form of type uh, to zero, which uh, sorry, a, a form which which has you know a, a one one part and a two zero zero two part, and indeed like del f del t is just minus rho bismuth. That's true, but the thing is, in, in many interesting cases, you can set it up in such a or um, yeah, you can choose this beta or you can choose this beta in such a way that it will be closed, but not always. Not always. Um, I guess, 
I'm not, it's not quite an if and only if, but basically, I guess in the Kaler setting, you can, you, if you have like DD bar lemma, you can set up, you can choose this beta so that this initial F is closed. And then of course it stays closed. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think maybe I erase this, that's okay. Um, Um, but yeah, um, that is possible. Um, but so, okay, so you can probably guess now what we're going to do. I mean, I've got this, this sort of bad positive term here, but then I've got this good negative one here. So I'm just going to put them together. So now let, say, phi be this log of the volume ratio. plus the magnitude beta squared. And then just putting these two inequalities together, we get that h phi is less or equal to zero. OK? So by the maximum principle, the soup at time t of phi will be bounded above by its initial value, which I just call a constant. But then phi is just a sum of these two positive terms, right? So um, so then I get this upper volume form bound. OK. And so now it's it's done, right? I I at this point have um, I have the the lower bound for for the metric, which I got just directly from this maximum principle, and then I've managed now to estimate the determinants uh, from above. And so again, just algebraically, these two things then give uh, the the uniform equivalence. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm curious that you you need to argue in the opposite direction as in so in the Keller setup you first found the volume and then the trace and here you're first. Yeah, I trace. I don't know. I guess I I'm not sure why I chose this order. Maybe just because the lower bound is easier uh, in in this case. Um, but in a sense, those two estimates are totally independent of one another. Um, yeah, so um, okay, so so we have we have the upper and, and lower bounds. And uh, so now what we need is this higher regularity step. Um, and maybe uh, I know it's uh, um, sort of maybe more uh, geometers than, than PDE uh, people in the crowd, but um, maybe just to, to try to put it in context, as a PDE problem, um, we are asking for basically like a C alpha estimate or C1 estimate for uh, the metric, so which any way you want to describe it, um, whether you use this one form reduction or just the equation on the metric or whatever, so which is described as a system, so emphasis on system of parabolic equations, sort of assuming uniform parabolicity. So we now have established the uniform parabolicity, right? So we have this, that the coefficients of the equation are bounded 
purely in terms of some against some background metric. But the point is, th there is no general theorem for this. So, so I didn't mention this in the in the Kaler ET flow case, but you can invoke this general result now of like Evans Kreloff to, to claim once you have the uniform equivalence of the of the metrics, then then your this parabolic Mangin pair is a convex fully nonlinear parabolic equation, and you can invoke these, this general method of Evans Kreloff to, to get the C alpha estimate or C, C2 alpha estimate for the potential, which is like a C alpha estimate for the metric. Um, but then there's also this kind of more geometrically natural way um, by estimating the difference of churn connections, you know, which is what we discussed. But the point is for, for this type of system of equations, there's just no general result. There's nothing you can quote. Um, but so instead, yeah, so, so here's finally where the, the real sort of kind of generalized uh, objects show up. So, so the idea is to consider uh, G, which I'm gonna just write sort of in terms of uh, local coordinates. So this is G I J bar plus um, beta I K, G, uh, L bar, K, beta bar, L bar, J bar, um, and then uh, G, I, uh, K bar, beta bar, K, J bar, um, and here I have G upper J bar I, and um, and then here I have um, beta I K G J bar K. So probably I have. Um, so <clears throat> so. What I'm going to do is consider so so this is at least locally, and that's sort of good enough for the proof. So so this is a Hermitian metric on t one zero plus t star one zero. So like for, for generalized Ricci flow, right? We describe all the structure in terms of, um, well, we can think of it equivalently as this flow of G and B uh, or as this flow of like the generalized metric, capital G. Uh, there, the generalized metrics are thought of as endomorphisms of this generalized tangent bundle. Here I'm, I'm literally, I mean, it's really not that different. I'm just sort of lowering an index and, and I'm genuinely thinking of this, this big metric on this, on this bundle, okay? And the sort of amazing fact this time, um, so I'll, I'll write it in a, in a few ways. Um, And so, yeah, okay. And then here, here, this beta, it really is the same beta as before. But in general, you can just consider it as this evolution of d beta dt is minus rho bismuth to zero. It doesn't have to have sort of the specific uh, relationship to the alpha reduction, as I discussed. But but the amazing fact um, is that like in in local complex coordinates, uh, I'll, I'll say it in two ways. Sort of as a as a matrix, um, so so this scalar operator, this heat operator acting on um, like the coefficient matrix G I J, is uh, less or equal to zero. So this thing is a is a matrix subsolution of of the associated uh, time dependent heat operator. Now using this, you, you can adapt. This was like the original proof I, as I understood it. You, you can adapt this Evans-Kreloff method to, 
to give that that the metric has the C alpha estimates. Okay. But this is very uh, technical and, and not very geometric. So I, I just want to state, in any case, that this was sort of the, the original way that, that, I, that I understood this, but there's a better way. So, um, so also, um, so we can let uh, Nabla CG denote the so this capital G is a Hermitian metric on a holomorphic vector bundle, so it has some churn connection. Um, so, so this is the churn connection associated to uh, big G, and uh, I can call its curvature say omega big G. So this is like a one-one form with values in endomorphisms, right? Of of t one zero plus t one zero star, and then I can define this sort of Hermitian Yang Mills type quantity S, where I take the trace using the evolving Kähler form of this uh, big curvature. So so this thing is an endomorphism of T10 plus T star 10. And this is exactly sort of the quantity that shows up in Hermitian Yang Mills theory. This is what they call S in that theory. Hermitian Yang Mills theory for like for this bundle. Okay. And so, so the sort of better way, I mean, in any case, I stated this as some, as some inequality, which has some other negative terms on the right-hand side, but the simpler fact um, is just the following, is that dg dt is minus s. Uh, s, uh, yeah, and, and I, I also have to lower the index with, with g, but let me just suppress that. Right, so, so this is strictly speaking an endomorphism, but I have to lower the index with big G. Okay. So is this uh, some sort of a um, um, Hermit Young Mills uh, flow? For yeah, so, so um, uh, yes, but that has to be taken kind of with a with a grain of salt, right? So, so, so in Hermitian Yang Mills theory, th this would be exactly Hermitian Yang Mills somehow if this metric were fixed, right? Right. So, so how does Hermitian Yang Mills work? You fix a complex manifold, you fix some Hermitian metric on that, and then you're and then you're working on some auxiliary bundle where you 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 change the metric on that bundle, but you sort of keep your metric on the manifold fixed. But here it's all coupled, right? Everything in sight is coming from this one pluriclosed metric. But eventually, if everything converges, you will hit. Um... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, in fact, yeah, like immediately there's kind of some like obstructions and consequences for like that possible was, fixed points. Was, oh, yeah. That was my next question. <laughs> yeah. In fact, that is something I guess we still have not completely worked out. Um, but, uh, but it is definitely true that. Uh, um yeah that that um you you can say you, you get sort of non-trivial consequences for like the existence of a bismuth ricci flat metric uh for instance coming coming from this from this point of view bismuth ricci flat it would just be zero right like dgdt would be zero s would be zero and so yeah but it's i think uh, well, it's in any case, it's it's more delicate to use that point of view because of this point that that you're always using the time evolving metric. Okay, but so in any case, uh, once uh, once we have this, then it turns out that um, there's a much simpler way to get this this higher order regularity that's more akin to to the proof I discussed last time. So, um, so 
we can define, say, epsilon of, say, g, g tilde. So I can fix some background Hermitian metric on this bundle. And this is just the, the difference of the, of the churn connections. Okay. So this is a one form with values and endomorphisms of this sort of generalized bundle. And then uh, here again, the sort of amazing fact is that if you apply the heat operator to the magnitude of epsilon squared, and here this norm is taken. So, so yeah, let me, let me pause for a second. So, so this is a one form with value values and endomorphisms of this T one zero plus T star one zero. And so I have sort of like three indices that I need to measure with, res with respect to some metric and I'm gonna use, well, maybe that is good. So I'm gonna use little g, uh, big G and big G. And then the claim is this is uh, less or equal to zero. And in general, um, maybe I what, one of the big G's is G tiled, I think. No, no. But why? It's, it's just like in the Kähler case. Like in the Kähler case, you 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 measure the norm of the difference of churn connections always using the 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 sort of unknown metric using the, the, the flowing metric. Okay. Okay. Um, so this inequality is in all cases, not only in the flat case. Okay. Yeah. I was just about to say a no, uh, but, but it's still a, a very strong statement in general. So, so in general, it's, um, um, uh, what's the simpler way, simple way to write it. So it's basically just a combination of, uh, the, like, curvature terms uh, coming from the background curvature G tilde um, uh, tensor like G. Uh, um, let, let, me, let me just state it in a, in a vague way. I mean, the precise formulas are, are in the papers. Um, and then also, I guess you get like a background covariant derivative of omega G tilde again, acting on G somehow. And so, um, and actually, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm giving the, the talk in a sort of simplified way, where in the flat case, this is just, just like flat out has a sign. But in general, yeah, there's some terms involving the sort of background uh, curvature. But actually, nonetheless, even with these terms, uh, this, this point of view sort of resolves the high regularity question in general. So, so if you have like a pluriclose flow and you have the uniform equivalence of the metrics, then you can get the C alpha regularity from this, from this inequality. Yeah. So it does give like a, a general answer to, to that so question. What happens with the the heat operator applied to, to G, uh, you, you said that this already gives you the C alpha estimate, but why do you need this other estimate in this case? Well, because I, I'm not, I'm not giving the actual, there's a lot of proof here, actually. There's like a lot oh. of technical stuff. And I mean, and at least the, this initial way of understanding it, I mean, there's a lot of missing geometry, I guess. Um, so this, yeah. this only works because you have a, this, uh, flat background calorimetric, otherwise? No, um, okay, yeah. Uh, th this one also, uh, in general, you have like less or equal to some background terms. Um, but I guess there's maybe maybe a few, a few points to be made. So, so one is that like, if, if you're already assuming you have uniform equivalence of the metrics, which we basically are at this point, then you can even sort of localize this estimate. You can just pick some ball of a definite size and you basically can set up with respect to a completely trivial background. And then this inequality is as it is as I wrote it. 
um, it is lesser equal to zero. And, and you can just apply this evans krelov method like purely, it's just like happening on a ball in CN and you can get this alpha estimate. Um, that's one thing, but uh, yeah, I, but in any case, there's a lot of like technical details involved in this. Whereas this kind of more geometric point of view gives you this sort of very nice differential inequality which okay has this more general form and I think is has a lot more applications maybe yet to come coming from this this point of view. Um, and and you know sort of uh, much more directly gives the proof. I don't have to there, there's no technical arguing here, right? It's just immediately from the maximum principle. This might be a kind of silly question, um, but so the the identities that Mario works out in the bismuth flat thing, um, does that give that this Hermitian Yang Mills is what like sufficient to get a solution for Plurry closed flow? Um, no, I mean because you you can't really like decouple the problem. It's like I I need a metric G on the uh, like a like a pluriclose metric G in the usual sense, such that you have this kind of associated generalized metric, which is um, which which has this s equals zero, I guess. Um, but it is equivalent, I guess. I mean, yeah, like the s equals zero will imply that rho bismuth is zero, and and vice versa. Rho bismuth zero implies that this s is zero. So, uh, in this heat operator applied to to the big G metric. Uh, this is just the the linearization of 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 the S operator, right? If so if you if you um, linearize this Hermite Einstein. Well, no, I mean this is this is really just the same heat operator as before. This is literally just like scalar churn Laplacian. Yeah, oh, yeah. What, what I mean is, if I take the, if I take a, what you call S, applied to the metric G, then the linearization of of this is precisely, I mean, the linear part is is the Laplacian, is the Chern Laplacian oh, applied to yeah, G. Yeah, yeah. But then you get this other non-linear term. So, I guess you're using something for, for this other estimate, right? I mean, it's not so clear to me that partial partial G with respect to T minus the Laplacian is going to be give you something negative. So you have to work. So. Oh, well, yeah, this is sort of, um, oh, okay, I, I see your point. I mean, you you can, um, it, it's, it's sort of like some underlying like sort of convexity of this operator S. So like in, in general, if you think about, if you have just like, forget all this specific situation, you just have like two Hermitian metrics on some holomorphic vector bundle. You take the difference of their S's. Um, um, and yeah, I guess you, you, you can express it basically as like the Laplacian, the turn Laplacian with respect to one of the difference. And then there will be a sort of square gradient term, which, which will be a square, it will have a sign. And that's really kind of what this inequality is, is hiding. Yeah, is this kind of square term. That's basically, um, well, in fact, it's very similar to the to norm epsilon squared, in fact, is you're basically getting, that, that's sort of what, what's appearing on, on the right-hand side here. It's, it's essentially a, a natural square term, which measures the sort of first order difference of the two metrics. Okay, I see. Um, but yeah, um, th th yeah, th those facts are kind of, um, I guess, like general to the theory of Hermitian Yang Mills. I think the sort of surprising part to me is that, like, sort of, I mean, you have to sort of imagine taking the evolution of this G you, is this strange nonlinear combination of bismuth to zero, well, uh, of bismuth curvatures, bismuth Ricci curvatures. And then somehow miraculously, it all just boils down to this S. Um, so, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, th this gives, 
uh, that that the metric um, GT has a uniform uh, C1 estimate. And then again, we can, at, at this point, we can invoke this very general uh, Schauder theory to get the GT has uh, uniform C infinity estimates. Okay. So, so at this point, our, our, we, we sort of can just punt to, to very general theory. So, so we have that the coefficients are already in C1. And then so this general Schauder theory gives you uniform C infinity estimate. Okay, so um, so that is the the whole proof of the existence. Okay, so so this all, all these estimates were uniform in time. So so that gives us the global existence. And so last, there's the question of uh, convergence. Okay, and uh, here again, I think uh, mostly we'll we'll sketch the proof, but so. Um, we recall this uh, monotonicity of, of this f functional of f. So this is in the M scalar curvature minus 112 mu squared plus norm f squared e to the minus f dg and then lambda gh. This is the amp over uh, e to the minus f dvg equals one of f ghf. Um, and so we know that for a solution to um, so along this generalized Ricci flow, a lambda is monotone increasing and um, fixed only on uh, solitons. And so, well, with all this strong uh, regularity that we have um, can show um, you can show that at least some subsequence tj uh, going to infinity, um, these, these metrics at some time will converge uh, to some metric g infinity, which has to be a soliton. Okay. So in any case, uh, there's maybe some I don't know technicalities, I guess, uh, hidden. There's you have to apply these like compactness theory for um, for solutions to the flow. But in any case, uh, it's a fairly it's a fairly straightforward thing. Um, uh, and then and then the last point is is there's a rigidity in this case. So rigidity. of steady solitons um, on a Kähler manifold um, with C1 equals zero. In fact, sorry, sorry let, let me let me state it differently. Um, steady solid virginity of steady solitons um, when C1 is zero in this so-called bot churn cohomology. Okay. Um, in particular, they must be must be Kähler. Okay. Actually, there's there's several ways to so, to sort of prove uh, the rigidity. In fact, you you can. 
uh, th this the, the the proof I give in the paper um, we use this uh, like this old vanishing result of Godeshan. But you can also derive it from, um, where did it go? Um, just the fact that we converge to any any fixed point at all, uh, or, or even like sort of a fixed point up to the dimorphism action, like a soliton, you, you can derive the rigidity from this inequality. Basically, along a along a soliton, uh, this this heat operator, while well, it's basically like you can treat it like it's uh, like it's zero, um, and uh, or or in any case, the the time derivative is just given by flowing by diffeomorphisms, which is a gradient operator, and then this just turns into like a, a you get a, a one sided uh, elliptic differential inequality um, for the Laplacian of norm beta squared, and so you get that all of these things vanish. Norm beta squared vanishes, and then this right-hand side vanishes. And once the right-hand side vanishes, then the torsion vanishes. OK. So anyways, it's a, um, probably a bit fast, but it, uh, it's sort of like a Bachner kind of argument, you could say. That if you have a soliton, you can use this equation to show it has to be uh, Kähler. And then once it's Kähler, uh, it's, it's Kähler, it's Ricci flat. And then because we're on a flat background, it has to just be flat. OK, this yields the uh, How did you use that the first in class is zero in both uh, I, I didn't for the argument I, I just described. Um, uh, the, there's, a, there's a result. Uh, th this, this vanishing result of Godeshan basically tells you um, um, it, it requires sort of interpreting the um, desmond Ricci curvature using the churn uh, curvature, but uh, his result, it's its a vanishing result that if C1 is zero in Bachrin cohomology and you have a certain sort of, a metric with, um, basically with positive churn scalar curvature, then the torsion has to vanish, has to be Kähler. Um, yeah, um, but like I said, you can also just derive it from this this flow of beta as well. But this gives that the limit g infinity is in fact uh, flat. And then, okay, uh, all this was so far was some subsequential convergence. Uh, but you can invoke again. This is something sort of technical that uh, is not maybe worth discussing here. So, so you can invoke a general sort of stability result. To claim the whole flow line converges. OK. So basically, the point is we know very far out at least some metric at some time is very, very, very close and some strong norm to a flat metric. And then we just claim that with that setup, the flow will just honestly converge, not just subsequentially. Um, Okay, so yeah, in any case, I'm just sort of uh, sketching this part. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, maybe yeah, it is already 2.30, but uh, yeah, I still think, so So, like I said, uh, there, there, there's this sort of forthcoming work with, with Mario and Josh where we sort of extend this story to in a sort of sharp way to a much broader class of backgrounds to sort of properly globalize this observation. So, so e even this kind of tensor equation, the way I wrote it, it's still using some kind of background assumptions, or you could say it only holds locally, kind of. Which again, is sort of good enough to just get these estimates, but it turns out there's a lot more you can do um, once you sort of properly globalized it. Um, and this is sort of, uh, to my eyes, like the, Sort of undeniable influence of like of generalized geometry uh, on this on this flow. Like somehow, I mean, it took me a while to even guess that I should maybe try this. And then it's just at first some horrible, nasty calculation, like to actually prove at least this much. But then it turns out that there's some very simple sort of generalized geometry sort of hiding underneath it, which explains all this stuff uh, much better. And I think there's probably still a lot more <laughs> waiting to be explained. Um, but yeah.
I don't know, are there any other uh, questions? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.